Welcome everybody, welcome to our talk, verifying open service broker API compliance and testing production environments. Oh, sorry. So, um, I'm Robert, I'm a platform engineer at any nice. I'm Oliver. I'm uh, part of the same team as Robotis. So we are both part of the Inline's data services team. And on a daily basis, more or less, we are working with the Open Service Broker API, uh, OP, uh, API. Sorry, And we are here to share our experience in using and testing the Open Service Broker API uh, in production environments. <clears throat> so. A few years ago, um, we have enc encountered Cloud Foundry, and a few people in our company thought, hey, this is awesome, this is cool, this is a game changer, let's use it. So for a few years now, we have a public pass offering um, based on Cloud Foundry called Anynines. <laughs> so the same name as our company name. And um, in the, in the uh, in the early days, our, our developers realized that uh, using build packs and pushing uh, apps is, is really, really cool. But on the other hand, when it comes to the begging services that came with Cloud Foundry in the early days, um, it wasn't that great anymore. Um, so we saw an opportunity here to create data services that, run, uh, that are production ready and we could ship to our customers. <clears throat> So um, after a while, we put together some kind of a mission statement, um, fully automating the entire lifecycle of a wide range of data services to run on cloud-native platform, platforms um, across infrastructure at scale. So <laughs> pretty long mission statement. and might sound pretty scary, but it's pretty awesome. OK. Um, so with this mission statement, we started with Postgres and MongoDB data services. We created them and provided those service offerings in our um, public paths. And yeah, the, the, the open service um, broker API is, is a rather lean interface to easily provide backing services to Cloud Foundry. So um, since a while now, um, it's an open standard that has even been adopted by other technologies like Kubernetes and Kubernetes-like distributions like OpenShift, for example. And we had even a customer that <laughs> communicated with our service broker just using the open service broker API, which was pretty cool. So, um, yeah, it allows the service providers, so this open service uh, broker API, it allows the service providers to, um, to provide their uh, offerings in a self-service uh, fashion to application developers. And so if you're a developer and you are interested, for example, in Postgres service, you just, just have a look at the, uh, at the CF marketplace and hopefully you would somehow find a suitable Postgres database service maybe, hopefully. And this um, data, serv data service is then rather easily to create, right? You just need CF create service, uh, you issue this command and it will automatically provision uh, this service for you. Um, this request gets redirected to the service broker, uh, implemented by the service provider. And yeah, provisioning in this context can mean many different things. Like for example, provisioning could mean, hey, create a container on a shared VM, or create a database in a shared database cluster, or even create a dedicated cluster just for the, uh, on virtual machines, just for the service. Yeah, and there are many other endpoints that you just need to implement. Uh, and once you implement all those API um, endpoints, you are ready to integrate your service into the marketplace. Um, but at the first glance, it might seem to be rather easy, but we learned at any nines that there are yeah, a lot of other non-functional requirements that you need to fulfill in order to be somehow enterprise ready. 
um, yeah, while the service uh, broker interface is really simple. So there is a method, for example, to provision a service instance, and there is a method to, for example, provision a credential set. And that's basically it. So when looking at the specification, you think, oh, that's easy. I'm going to write my own service broker. And then you deploy it to production, and then the, you learn a, a few hard things we learned um, a few years ago. Like, for example, um, that you want your production load to run on dedicated virtual machines, or at least um, right now you want that, because even if containers are coming quite fast and are quite popular, um, when it comes to run databases, it's a good idea to run them in a virtual machine, because the isolation is just better, and especially larger enterprises, um, they just feel better when this, this kind of workload runs in a an, in an virtual machine, isolated with technology that has been proven for many years. Um, and because you want to use virtual machines, you want to use an um, on-demand provisioning. So this means you don't want to allocate resources in advance. You want to allocate resources, virtual machines, whenever there's a request to provision a new virtual machine. And when it comes to testing, that gets quite hard because provisioning a virtual machine um, takes some time, so five minutes. It, it depends on the infrastructure. Their infrastructure, it takes 10 minutes. So. Um, you have, when, when writing tests, you have to be very careful with when provisioning a machine and whatnot. Um, another um, requirement that we learned is important and that makes testing very, very hard and ensuring that it works is that we want um, our services to be installable by the customer side on premise. And we want this, um, we will, we want this to be possible by using Bosch or by using uh, the Pivotal Ops Manager, for example. Um, and another thing we want is that um, we want that our um, solution works at many infrastructures. So wherever Cloud Foundry runs, there should, it should be possible to install the data services there. So as you can imagine, there, there are a lot of different environments where we want our data services to work and to function. Um, yes, yeah, Robert already explained, we all also want these um, services to consume by multiple platforms, not only Cloud Foundry. We want them to be consumed, for example, by Kubernetes. Um, another functionality that or requirement that we have is that we want our services to be highly available, not only the service brokers, which actually manage the service provisioning, but also the service instances. Like, we want to have a Postgres cluster set when, that when one node fails, there are two other nodes taking over the, the workload. Um, of course, we want backups of our data services. Um, we want to have a configurable backup schedule, and we want that we want these backup functionalities to be provided to the end user by an API or by a dashboard. So the end user should be able to create backups and restore them. And of course, we want monitoring. And capacity upgrade. That is actually a feature that is covered by the Open Service Broker API. Uh, yeah, in, in terminology of um, Open Service Broker API, it's called plan updates. So if you monitor your service instance and you recognize, OK, I'm running out of disk, I want to add more disk to my service instance. Um, you do a plan update. Um, yeah, all these things, um, that are things we learned. We have to pay attention when implementing this broker API and which we already somehow want to test. Um, to implement these, we came up with a microservice architecture. Um, from the top view, it looks like there are 10 microservices playing together to fulfill these this requirements. Um, if we scale in, we see that there are more than 40 components um, included and played together to, to actually make that happen. Um, when we have a look at the, the, uh, the uh, good practice, how to structure our tests, we see a common, uh, common pattern what, which is called test pyramid. So it actually says that we should have different kinds of tests. We should have unit tests which provides you very fast feedback cycles, they are executed on the code level. So whenever a developer works on a, on a code base to, to implement a new feature, he executes the unit test suite and he gets feedback that he broke something. And on the upper level, we have integration tests. So these tests usually take longer than the unit tests. So it takes longer that we get feedback that we broke something, but they are more robust. They test more because they test how our components interact with each other. And, and in the end, we have these end-to-end -end tests or manual tests. Um, these are tests from the user perspective, where we consume the functionality from the user perspective, as the user does. 
And in the early days, let's say three years ago, when we started developing those data services, um, we followed that test pyramid. We had a, a large set of unit tests. We had a large set uh, of integration tests. Not that much that unit tests, but we had them. Um, but still, in, in production deployments, we encountered some issues. Um, so we ended up in testing and testing more and more manual, manual steps. So we ended up in having a test protocol. Whenever we ship a new re, uh, release, we, we click through the UI and we, we say CF create service because we just lose, lost trust in our, our integration test because there are so many moving components um, that we have to somehow yeah, still make a test from the end user perspective. And that was very hard to release new features and to release new releases of those data services. So what we did is we automated those end-to-end -end tests. And um, when it comes to integrating new data services, we have another requirement in our um, service framework. That is, we want to use our existing components and integrate new services into the marketplace um, very fast. Um, yeah. And when we, for example, integrate a new test into the test suite, we want this test to be available for each existing service. And another requirement we have, because we are deploying those data services in, a, in many, many environments which are not, not the same, we want these tests to be executable by the customer. So the customer can verify by themselves whether this release works like in, intended. Um, to make the the customer able to execute those tests, we came up with a, with a Bosch release errand. So we are deploying the services with, a Bosch, with Bosch. So that was a natural fit to, to use a Bosch errand. So once you have configured a Bosch and once you have deployed the product with Bosch, you can run this errand with one command. And then it ver verifies everything, whether, whether the main features from the user per perspective work as expected. Um, you can see that you can actually configure which types of uh, services should be tested. So you can configure that a MongoDB 3.6 and a MongoDB 3.4 uh, should be tested. And you also can configure which plans should be tested. For every plan you configure, um, the smoke test or the test suite will actually create a service instance and perform some actions on that. Um, because that takes a while, we have the possibility to parallelize that. So at the top you see, um, how, how many, many tests you want to run in parallel. Um, we also have feature flags for those tests. So this means not every service supports every, every feature. And so you can disable these, these flags for, for different services. And sometimes you don't want to execute all of the tests. You want to have a faster feedback, but test less. And then you can actually turn off those features. Um, Another thing you see here is that because we are testing that from the user perspective, right? We are specifying a Cloud Foundry endpoint. So at the end, the, the test suite will actually um, talk to Cloud Foundry and and actually create services and use them from the Cloud Foundry perspective. So that is quite important because um, there's some Cloud Foundry features within those services, like for example, automatically creating application security groups um, by using. The Cloud Foundry setup to, to verify that everything works. Um, yeah, we actually also implicitly test whether the security groups works and and so on. Also important is that, for example, you missed one change in the uh, Open Server Broker API specification, which has been implemented in Cloud Foundry, and then that test suite will tell you, okay, that that version of Cloud Foundry is not compatible anymore with with that Service Broker API. So please go and fix that. Um, this, this test suite or this errand then performs a couple of, of test cases. Like, for example, the service instance creation. So we create a service instance and we test that this service instance can be accessed by an application deployed to, to that Cloud Foundry setup. Um, we test that the bindings work and that the bindings can be used, that apps can access um, the service instance using these bindings. Um, that the deletion of the bindings works, and that when a binding has been deleted, the credential of that binding is not usable anymore. That arbitrary parameters or custom user parameters works. That plan update works like expected. And that the backup and restore works. Um, 
to, to encapsulate, yeah, the goal was to, to actually minimize the effort to introduce new, new services into a marketplace. So we somehow had to come up, came up with um, a generalized testing framework as well. So we have a framework for integrating new services into the marketplace, and we came up with a framework to integrate new tests into, into this um, test framework. Um, our first attempt was called the Service Binding Checker. That was a small application that has been deployed to Cloud Foundry. It has an interface that allows you to access the database in a generic way. So it doesn't matter whether it's a Postgres, whether it's a RabbitMQ or a Redis, we always use the same interface. So we don't distinguish here uh, between different service types. Um, the application reads credentials from the VCAP services. You probably know the VCAP services environment variable. So Whenever you bind an application or a service to an application, um, Cloud Foundry will expose the credentials to that service to the VCAP service variable. So the service binding checker reads the environment variable and tries to connect to that service instance. There's some other endpoints um, to make some other actions, but that's basically it. We will talk about the, the API of that, that application later. Um, yeah, and we try to make use of the service through that uh, generic API which encapsulate all service-specific implement, uh, implementations. Uh, that first attempt, it was written in Ruby, and because we run a lot of tests in parallel, so currently we have implemented seven different data service types, and we test a lot of service plans for each, um, for each data service, so it ended up in, in a massive amount of parallel test runs. And deploying this Ruby application for each test run was some kind of memory consuming. So we re rewrote that in Go, and we now call that binding Go, which is something like binding checker app in Go. And it actually has that interface. It's, as I said, it's a generic interface. It allows you to test the service instance through that application um, by using that generic interface. For example, we have a status endpoint, which for the implementation of Postgres creates a, ta creates a table within the database um, inserts a record, and then um, deletes that record and deletes that uh, table from the database. For RabbitMQ, it looks a bit different, but it's the same interface. For RabbitMQ, we create a RabbitMQ queue, and then we insert a message, we consume that message, and then we delete the queue. And then it's the same for, for Redis. We just insert a key value store and delete the key value store. That, that happens when we call the status endpoint. Um, you see a more specific example in the bottom. So the only thing that is specific here is the name. Um, we say we want, we want to test that Postgres instance, and then that is everything that has been uh, different, to, yeah, different to all the other tests. If you want to test, if you bind the Redis there, we say INNS Redis, and then we test the Redis instance. So this abstraction, or the encapsulation of every service-specific thing into this API, gives us uh, the possibility to actually um, automate these test cases we want to test in a, in a generic way. So everything else is now generic and can be reused um, across different data service types. Um, so let's go through these uh, test cases and, and see how we perform these test cases by using this um, Bindingo API. So the first test case would be to have uh, to, to simply ch check the service access, whether the application can access the service. So um, we deploy or we create a service instance of a service we want to test. Then we push the Bindingo application. That is actually, that is actually the logic which the errand um, executes when you say, um, please execute the, the smoke tests. Um, yeah, we push a, a, an instance of that Bindingo application and we wait until the service is ready. And we wait until um, the application is ready. So, um, Deploying the application and creating the service, that is something that takes some minutes, and that's why it's executed in parallel. But once both is finished, we bind that service to service instance, and we bind that service to the Bindingo application, we restart the Bindingo application, and then we um, call this endpoint, the status endpoint of the Bindingo application we just deployed. And then the, the Bindingo app, app writes a data record in the database and says, uh, status code 200, everything went fine, or there was something um, wrong. Um, maybe check whether the Cloud Foundry application security groups has been created. 
Another test case we execute is we check that each service binding gets its dedicated credentials. So how does this work? So again, we create a service instance. We push uh, a Bindingo application, and we push a second Bindingo application. Then we wait uh, until everything is finished, so the service is ready, and both, both Bindingo applications are running. And then we bind both applications to the same service instance. We, we bind both um, applications to the same service instance. We have to restart both applications. And then we check the status of both applications, and we expect um, both requests to succeed. Next step, um, we unbind the first thing, the first application, we restart the first application, and again, we execute the status endpoint. And we expect this, and we execute the status endpoint of the second one. And what we expect now is that the first request fails with a status code 500, and the second request succeeds. So that way we ensure that um, once we delete a service binding, this credential set is not usable anymore, but all the other credential set can still be used. And last but not least, um, we unbind the second one, we restart the second one, and we expect both calls to fail. Um, another interesting test case is how we use that Bindinger API to test the backups and the restores. So, we use the service instance from the previous test case. Usually we do that because provisioning a service takes long, so we try to reuse instances as, as much as possible. Um, we, again, we bind the Bindingo application to the instance. We check whether the binding works, just to be sure. And then we use the put endpoint to insert, to insert a record. And then the put endpoint actually expects um, a body. Um, which contains a test a key value pair. And then that one, in case, because it's a Postgres instance, um, the test will actually create a, a, a table within the database and insert um, that, that data into the table. And then we check with the exists endpoint whether this, this write request from the previous put request has been successfully inserted. And once this has been verified, we trigger a backup. And then we wait until the backup is successfully created. So in that case, it only takes a few seconds because it's a quite um, small database. Um, once a backup has been created successfully, we delete that data record from, from the database. Again, here we are using Postgres. It could also be on, on Redis or, um, or MongoDB. The logic is then the same. Um, once the record is deleted, we verify that it's really gone. Uh, so we expect this get, uh, get request to fail. And then we restore the backup. And then we wait until the backup is, uh, the restore is successfully created. And then we check again whether the, the key is back again. And we expect that check to, to succeed because we restore the backup and expect the backup to have the data. Um, another test case is the plan update. Um, again, we use the, the service instance from the previous test case. Um, we ensure the binding is still present, and then we ensure the binding still works. And then we insert the data again. Then we check the data has been inserted successfully. Then we trigger a backup. Even we're doing a plan update, we're triggering a backup now. Um, we wait until the backup is succeeded. Then, then we make a plan update. We wait until the plan update is succeeded. Um, we check that the service instance still works, the data can be written into the instance. We check that the data that has been inserted before the plan update is still in the instance after the plan update. We delete the test record. Um, we ensure the record has been deleted, and we restore the backup. And after that, we ensure that the backup that has been done with the old instance can still be restored on the new instance. Um, these are the basic tests which are executed by the smoke test. So whenever a customer runs uh, Bosch run errand, please test the this, uh, this service installation. These are the test cases that are executed. 
Um, it turned out that we can use the Spindingo application to even test more things. Like, for example, we have deployed our data services in version 1 to the customer. And now we want to update the whole setup to a new version. Um, so we can use this, this, this test logic to test that update. And how that works is um, we deploy um, the one version of the data service solution. Then, yeah, service, service is deployed in version X. Then we create a service instance. Then, again, we push the Bindingo application. We wait a, until everything is ready. Then we put a test record into the database. We trigger a backup. We wait until the backup is succeeded. Um, and then we update the management components to the new version. Management components is meant the service broker itself, or the, the, those 10 microservices that are involved in managing the service instances itself. Um, once these management components are updated to the new version, we update the service instances to the new version. Um, once the update is finished, we check that all service instances that we have provisioned before the update are still working by calling the status endpoint. And again, the status endpoint will then insert some data into the services and maybe insert a an, an message if it's a RabbitMQ or something like that. Um, and we check that, that the, the data is still in the, in the database that we have um, inserted before the update. Then we delete the data record. Then we ensure it's deleted. And then we restore the backup again. So we ensure that the backup that ha has been created with the old version of the data, uh, data service version can be restored on the new version. Another thing this uh, Bindingo API can be used for is load tests. Actually, when you implement those four endpoints I've showed you um, previously, you get a, load, a simple load test um, um, for free. So actually, you then have that API and you can actually say, please run a, run a load, te load test on um, that service instance bound on that application. And you can specify for how long the load test should run, um, 1,200 seconds in that example, how many insert operations should be done uh, per second, and how, how large the, the um, data should be that is, gets inserted into the, the service instance. The result of that request is a, a report. So, uh, you send that request and you immediately get back one re uh, report and this report um, contains an ID which identifies the load test which is currently run. And using that ID, you can check what's the current status of the load test, what are the current statistics, and there's also a flag which indicates whether the load test is still running or whether it's finished. Um, let's talk about the future plans we have um, with this uh, test, test framework. Um, currently, we're using the CF CLI to, to actually talk to Cloud Foundry and um, yeah, test the things from the user perspective. A colleague of us came up with a service broker CLI, and the idea of that service broker, a, a, a service broker CLI is to mimic um, the CF CLI so that, in theory, we can just replace the CLI within our tests, and then um, that's it. We then don't test, um, we are Cloud Foundry anymore, we then test the Service Broker API directly, um, which might gain us some, some um, yeah, speed when it comes to feedback cycles, so tests should run faster then. It should run faster because we don't have to deploy the binding um, applications every time we run a test. Um, another kind of tests we have is we, we have um, integration tests, or what we call Bosch release tests. So because we're deploying our data services with Bosch, we, for example, have a Bosch release for Postgres, for RabbitMQ, and for every service we offer. Um, and we have a massive test suite that actually runs against that Bosch release. And it works like that. It provisions that Bosch release without using a broker or anything else. It provisions a Bosch release, and it checks that, for example, this Postgres cluster is working like expected, even in failure scenarios. So it um, manipulates the IP table rules on the VMs and um, simulates a split-brain situation, for example, and checks that the cluster doesn't end up in a split-brain situation and that 
that when resolving this split brain situation, the cluster uh, again still joins and repairs itself. It also checks what happens if the master dies. So it crashes the master and ensures that, that the failover happens and that the new master can accept data and that the data is replicated to the uh, remaining slaves. Um, currently, building a new data service, building this kind of tests is, is quite hard and it's the major, major task we have to do when, for example, integrating a new data service into the marketplace. Um, yeah, that is, that is the, the kind of work we struggle most with or we invest most work into. And the idea is to have to use this Bindingo application and to have a generic uh, Bosch release test. So um, we just have to specify a few parameters. For example, um, in, in case of a split brain scenario, a Postgres cluster should behave like that and that, um, and a CouchDB uh, cluster should behave like that and that. Um, yeah, that's a, the idea with the Bosch release tests, and how we can make use of um, yeah, how we can make use of the Bindingo API in testing the Bosch releases itself in failure scenarios. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions? In retrospective, how much sense did it make f um, to have this one generic app with all the test cases in, besides having the test cases in the service brokers or the services themselves, and just calling them from there? Because I think it's it's very specific to the service what you actually want to test. Um. I mean, you only talked about data services. Maybe yes. that that. Uh, gives a, um, a smaller context or a smaller scope. But we, for example, we have a lot of different services starting from logging to messaging to databases to sp think about a Spring Cloud suite or whatever. Yeah, so, so uh, there's a trade-off between how generic is it and how, how practicable is it. We also have applied that test suite to an Elk stack. So we have an Elk stack as a service and we already learned that that API does, yeah, it's hard to you to abstract the log messaging thing into that API. Um, so there might be some limitations, but I guess for the use cases we have or for the use cases we aim for in the next few years, I guess that can save us a lot of time. Um, sure, there can be some services or some some kind of softwares that that doesn't fit into that abstraction we came up with within that API. Um, yeah. So, but. Does it work? No. Another idea is that instead, I mean, of using, uh, of testing all this errand with Cloud Foundry, for example, we can switch Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes, for example. So it allows us to really test against a real system, right? It's not only like faking something, but you can actually test against Cloud Foundry, switch it to Kubernetes, and so on. So this makes it possible and if you just use the broker test for example it's fine but it will not work in the longer run because you need to verify that it works with cloud phone the kubernetes and maybe other systems okay another question I have uh, two questions um, one was um, regarding your smoke test during um, you provision this app, bind this app, uh, write, uh, create some inter entries in the database and so on, and uh, later on at the end, you deleted the first app, and then you tested uh, if this first app is really not ac uh, accessible to the instance, and I didn't got it. Um, why you do this when you have two instances running? Ah, right. I'll test if yeah. one is inaccessible to the database, um, what, why? So um, that's not clear to me, that's the first one, and the other one is, um, could you, at the end of this test, send some real results, or where do you proceed with this? To, to, is um, it possible to, to the, the first question? put it somewhere with REST or something else? Yeah, the first question is, um, was in this dedicated credential test, um, why we do create, deploy two apps and why we do create two bindings? The idea is that when you bind an application to, um, to a service, that this application gets a credential set to access the service. Um, 
And we have the requirements for most of our services that we bind the same service to a different application, right? Um, we somehow want to have a different credential set. So we have two, two credentials for each of the applications. And the idea is that we will, when we delete one credential set by unbinding the application, right, we want this credential set to be not used anymore. Um, it can be that, for example, one application that makes use of your service um, has been attacked by, by a hacker or something like that, and the credentials has been exposed to that hacker. And then you want this credential set to be unusable. So you unbind uh, your application, and then you, we just ensure that's really um, implemented in a way that you can't use, make use of these credentials anymore once it has been unbound. You do verify only that the credentials are Right, right. And the second question is? So for, for the first question, we could sometimes also optimize, of course, that we don't push two or three instances of yeah. this binding Go app. Because currently we are reading VCAP services, for example, these environment variables. But you could also pass uh, credentials via user uh, UL parameters, for yeah. example, in the future. So we can just use binding Go app for different scenarios where we would normally push three or four binding Go apps. So we, yeah, okay. Yeah. And the second question is, um, we we put the results of the smoke tests into the log directory of the smoke test or of the smoke test errand, and then um, we stream them to a syslog endpoint, and then we can analyze them there. Um, I don't think we have time for other questions, but you can find us at the booth. So we are around at our booth. If you have any questions or want to discuss something, just come over there and grab some free T-shirts or something like that. <laughs> thanks. All right, thanks. <laughs>